During World War I, more than 350,000 African American soldiers enlisted to serve. But while they fought for democracy abroad, their own country, America, was still not willing to see them as equal. White supremacy was very mainstream at this time in the United States. Basically, a lot of African Americans were seeking to obtain their full rights and equality in the United States. And violence was often used by mobs of whites. Tensions reached a boiling point in the summer of 1919. Race riots broke out in dozens of cities across the country. But in the rural South, something even more menacing was taking form. There, slavery existed in all but name. In a system called sharecropping, farmers provided landowners with labor for a share of crops produced. But the system was rigged. Sharecroppers were often kept in perpetual debt. One black sharecropper raised $500 worth of cotton, and his landlord told him, yeah, but you used $697 worth of supplies, so you owe me money. Everyone who has any power at this point is working to make sure they keep African-American laborers tied to the land. For roughly 50 years, the system went unchecked. In the fall of 1918, a black man from Arkansas had had enough. Robert Hill had decided to form a union to represent sharecroppers. It was a dangerous decision, and one that would set off a chain of events involving mass murder, torture, and a landmark Supreme Court ruling. But first, he would need to organize. In his message, Hill was pretty simple and direct. Why is it that we cannot have fair payment for the honest and hard work we do? Despite the inherent risk involved with challenging whites, World War I veterans and other black sharecroppers became card-carrying members of the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America. He believed that by paying dues, these members could have the services of lawyers and sue plantation owners uh, for cotton that had been stolen from them and false numbers that had been placed in the plantation stores books. On the night of September 30th, 1919, union members gathered in Elaine to discuss their legal plan. This is in Phillips County. It's basically just a crossroads at this time, a road, a few houses, a railroad siding, There's no street lights. There's also a one room wooden church and that's where the union met. Expecting that they might have trouble, the union posted a guard of about six men. They had shotguns and rifles. The meeting's taking place. And while they're having this discussion, a car rolls up the road. Two white men were in the car. By one account, one of the white men in the car said, you all get away from there. And shortly thereafter, a shot was fired. Though it remains unclear who fired first, a barrage of gunfire broke out. One of the white men was killed almost instantly. The rumor of a black uprising spread in a matter of hours. The idea of a sharecropper rebellion conveniently played into the hands of landowners who did not want their sharecropping practices scrutinized. They did all they could, as quickly as they could, to sound alarms that black farmers were out for white blood. The story gets magnified that the town is under attack, that blacks are killing people in the streets, that there is a revolution afoot. The sharecroppers quickly formed self-defense groups, expecting repercussions over the death of a white man. But they could not have predicted just how severe the response would be. The following morning, under the watchful eye of Sheriff Frank Kitchens and his deputies, posses of white men were sent to find, detain, and kill the offenders. When you have an out-of-control mob just being told there's a Negro insurrection going on, that mob is being very indiscriminate in its violence. You see houses being attacked, black-owned homes being ransacked. The black school was burnt. Notable families were killed. Black women and children have to go literally hide out in the woods because many of these people are indiscriminately shooting at African-American women and their children. Black veterans and other African-Americans took up arms in self-defense. This no doubt just feeds into the mob fervor. The fact that, oh, they're daring to shoot back at us. This must really be an insurrection. One historian has identified more than 20 different killing sites where African Americans were being killed. There are stories that mob members were taking souvenirs, such as ears or fingers, from the bodies of fallen African Americans. One of the leading black families of the county, they weren't even in the town. They had just received a brother back from the French front. They are pulled from a train, put in the back of a car, and they are stabbed shot and their mutilated bodies are left on the side of the road. Within two days, 500 U.S. troops were sent to quell the supposed black uprising. 
they don't find any blacks killing or shooting down the streets. In fact, Colonel Jenks reports that the city is filled with hundreds and hundreds of white men with guns. Many of the individuals who were hiding in the thickets were former soldiers who had just gotten back from the war. And when they see the army troops come, they rush out, believing that the army troops are there to assist them. The army believes that these people are rushing toward them to attack, and they're cut down by machine gun fire. Although the exact number will never be known, a recent estimate suggests 237 black men, women, and children were killed. There was an immediate demand for justice, but not for the black lives lost. Five white men were also killed in the fighting. Hundreds of African Americans were rounded up and put in jail, and when the jail was full, they detained the rest in a schoolhouse. While they are detained, there is torture going on. The goal? To elicit false confessions of a black uprising. They whipped the men, whipped them for long periods of time. They stuffed formaldehyde up their noses, and they stripped them naked and shocked them with electrical charges. They did this until they confessed to the conspiracy. Robert Hill escaped to Kansas, but his peers back in Arkansas were not as lucky. 122 indictments were issued, and trials quickly started. The men were brought into the court in chains. They weren't allowed to consult with their defense attorney. The defense attorney rarely interjected, and then the all-white juries started delivering guilty verdicts. In one case, the guilty verdicts came back in two minutes. It's also important to point out that there were mobs of people outside who were demanding black blood. Governor Bruff maintained that at some point these people would be killed, but they would have to have been killed justly. The governor lived up to his word, when among the 87 black citizens charged with crimes, 12 were sentenced to death by electric chair. Despite the system being blatantly rigged against them, the convicted men had one unlikely beacon of hope, the American justice system. The trials of the Elaine 12 had been highly publicized, the NAACP took notice and stepped in with legal help for the 12. For four years, the team faced a series of legal setbacks and advances until in 1923, the case made its way to the Supreme Court in what is now known as Moore versus Dempsey. There, the defense argued that the original trials had been mob dominated and the black prisoners had been denied their constitutional rights. In a landmark decision, the court agreed. The good that comes out of this is that the NAACP sees for the first time that they can win in the Supreme Court, that things don't always fall along the color lines. The Twelve, subjected to torture, injustice, and litigation travesty, were at long last exonerated and released in January 1925. They might have escaped with their lives, but there was nothing that could reverse the pain and devastation felt by the black community in Phillips County, and no way to unsee the ungodly truth that American men, alongside the American government, were complicit in a massacre of American citizens on American soil. We as a nation have grown and we continue to grow. We don't need to pretend as if we've always had everything figured out, but if we are to do justice to who we are as Americans, we've got to own all of it. <laughs>